What significant advancement have you made on dealing with a stadium? Because that's an onerous cost according to, to the, the, the papers we have. What significant advance have you made on dealing with that? Sorry, what significant advance? What plans do you have to deal yeah. with the onerous cost, as you yeah. as it says in the papers, about the cost of running the stadium? Yeah. So um, there are significant challenges, and I think I've said this in various uh, committees and uh, probably in this forum uh, before around managing the stadium. Um, I suppose they, they break down into three or four main categories. Uh, I can say a bit about what we're doing uh, on each. Um, there is a challenge around the uh, seating system that's installed uh, and the costs and time of moving it. Uh, there's challenges around the sort of day-to-day -day operation uh, with, with, uh, on match days and other event days. Uh, the, the structure is quite complex, uh, and I'll say a bit more as I say about each of these. And because of the structure, I think we get less value from, from commercial rights than we could uh, otherwise. So um, I would say all those challenges are in the, in the context of a stadium that is, as I said in my opening words, a big part. We, we, we see it absolutely as fundamental to the uh, transformational benefit that's being delivered and the economic value that's being derived in the area because it does help raise the profile and bring all those uh, millions of people into, into the park in the area which creates economic activity and raises the profile. But we are tackling each of those issues specifically. Uh, on the seating, we've got uh, specialist engineers in looking at um, alternative ways we might configure the seating uh, we've got there to reduce cost and time of, of moves, and that will uh, may require some, some initial investment to produce long-term savings over the long term. But actually, we've already found incremental changes we can make. So, for example, for, um, for next summer's athletics, we've looked at a different configuration where we don't need to move the seats all the way back. We can do if you like, partial changes to each of the uh, stands, and it dramatically reduces the cost of, of seat moves. So those sort, that sort of very detailed work in the granular detail of, um, of, of the what's driving the cost and how we can reduce it is going on on the seating side. On match days, we're looking at um, reducing the cost of stewarding, for example, so managing crowds from the stadium, out of the stadium, through the park and into the stations um, is, is a significant challenge. I feel it's a, a symptom of success because Stratford has become so uh, busy and popular that the station is, is very crowded, the park is very crowded, uh, but that means we have to uh, spend significant money on managing the crowds. But we're looking at simplifying those egress routes, making them uh, move, move more uh, smoothly and, and less uh, interface with crowds coming out of Westfield uh, so that we can reduce stewarding costs. Uh, we're looking at uh, all of the contracts, we're looking at all the agreements that are in place and making sure we can maximise the benefit out of them, both in terms of uh, opportunities for, for further revenue and, uh, uh, and, and, and minimising costs. The ownership structure is being looked at, and I think I've said before that there's been discussions with, uh, between the Mayor of London and the Mayor of Newham around that, but it is having a joint venture ownership uh, and a joint venture body uh, is complicated uh, with then uh, an, an arm's length operator working contractually with, with the concessionaires, and we will look at that structure uh, and see how we can make that more efficient, and I think there will be decisions made on that in the near future. Um, but that structure does also mean that the rights are split, so we don't have the opportunity, as some other stadia do, to sell combined rights around, for example, the, the club and the venue and the secondary rights. They're, they're, the ownership at the moment, moment is split. So again, we're looking at, can we make that simple, more simplified to, to get better value? So I'm sorry that's a long answer, but, but if you're asking across the range of challenges, uh, on, on, on the stadium that came behind that, uh, that, that, that figure. Th that's then fine, thank you. C can I just ask something? There's a £200 million loss that's um, put, put in your accounts as a, an accounting convention. Could you give me some clarity on that? Uh, is there any point where we'll be e we're expected to contribute to fill that gap, or, or is it just a, yeah. a so, line of, in the account? So for, I think two things to say on that. First of all, that the that, that entry is the... It's a current year provision of what future years long-term losses might be. Um, not, so it's not a current loss, it's not, not a loss that's being incurred now. It's a, it's a projection that we have to make a provision in the accounts for, uh, for future losses. It, uh, effectively, if we didn't fix uh, the, the, the business of the stadium, whereas in fact, of course, all the things I've just explained to you are, are the steps we're taking to fix it. So it's not a current year loss, it's a projection of what losses would might be if those contracts all carried on uh, and without and how would that fixed. loss be covered if it happened? So, well, I think the point is it won't be. We're fixing yeah, it. But, but so but let's it just imagine for a minute things don't go your way. How would that loss be covered? Well, um, 
it, it would be a loss that the business would incur year on year over the very long term. We have 99 year uh, concession agreements with West Ham, so if nothing was done to fix it, um, it would be a loss that would be incurred annually. And the money but would but be I think that is, I think, I think, sorry, I think it's important to say nobody is working on that basis. We are working to fix it so that the loss is dramatically less. We are all look, working to make sure that the stadium contributes to the economic value of the regeneration in the area that's being delivered. And I would also like to say that I, the, the, it, it was never in, we never planned or anticipated the stadium making a significant uh, surplus into our, uh, into our financial position. The aspiration was that it would contribute to the legacy, and we, we want to get it to a, to a position where it breaks even, where it's not a, a drain on resources. And all the measures I've described are the ones we're taking to try and get I, it into I, I that accept, place. I accept the measures, and I, I desperately want it to succeed. We, we all do. But obviously, we have to be cognizant of the fact that you have put £200 million loss in here. At some point, that may need to be covered. Is, will that cover come from the GLA? I, I think I've said there is... The pro that is not going to occur because all again, the measures... Again, if, I, I, if, if, why if, is it in provision? Why, why is it in then? And, 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 and again, I, because, I really because, the, because the accounting requirement is that we, we recognise in our accounts the future... Where we have contracts that are, that are owners, which means they are a burden on the organisation, which yes, at the moment they that. are, that we recognise the future value, the future losses of those contracts um, as if uh, on, on the current information. And at the time we prepared our accounts, that, that was the information we I, had. I don't because, want to label the point, because I because think... The measures, because, so I do want to say, because the measures we are taking couldn't be recognised in, therefore, in reducing that... And, and that I accept the measures, and, and I, I wish you every success with the measures. You just be cognizant that bill will be coming somewhere, to my mind, here, so we'd, we'd like to know. One, one, other, one other small, maybe a small point, is the naming rights for the stadium. It would suggest that nobody's pursuing that. I, could you give us an update? Is somebody pursuing the naming rights? Is, is there... Is there someone waiting in the wings? Yes. You're courting? Uh, of course. Um, I, I, I don't want you to leave with the impression that you are going to fund that whole owner's contract provision, but I will we'll move okay, on. Okay, thank so you. So in relation to uh, naming rights, um, because of the uh, work that we are uh, doing now in relation to looking at the future of the stadium, we aren't actively pursuing uh, a naming rights partner. Um, we have um, had uh, a lot of interest in, in the past. You will know uh, there's been media reports which... Uh, reflect some of the interest that has been in the past. Um, I think it's worth saying again that you know, the stadium's been open operationally for just over a year. Um, we had, uh, you know, it, it opened for the start of the 16-17 football season. Um, it's not unusual where new uh, venues are looking for naming rights partners for, for that to be an exercise that does take a considerable time. So I'm not unduly concerned by the fact that just over a year after the stadium opening, it hasn't got a naming rights partner. Um, but whilst the work that's going on under the Mayor's review, uh, the Mayor announced that review also around a year ago, um, that, that we're not actively marketing the, the venue. We have, I should say, had a significant amount of uh, unprompted uh, and un uh, 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 well, unprompted interest from potential uh, sponsors uh, since the summer's events. I think the global profile that the World Athletics had and the uh, images of the stadium that were projected uh, did create a resurgence of interest in it, and we've had a number of, I can say, informal conversations of initial interest that were unprompted by our by our marketing. But um, so so we will come back to that, I think, once once the outcomes from the mayor's review are clear. Thank you. D did you say earlier on that, that the the mayor and E20 are looking at a different ownership model for the, for the stadium? Uh, I said that the ownership model was part of what's being looked at uh, in in terms of how the uh, future of the stadium is resolved. Yes. Do you see that as any problem looking for naming rights? Is that going to add a significant co cost? Uh, no, I think the, the ownership, so the ownership is currently split, uh, it, well, it's a joint ownership between ourselves at LLDC with the London Borough of Newham. So the joint venture that we refer to in, in uh, much of our papers, E20, is a joint venture body between, it's a, um, a limited uh, liability partnership between LLDC and Newham. Um, that means both we and Newham are involved and E20 itself as a separate entity. Mm -hmm. uh, it then has a contract with the operator <coughs> and then there are the relationships with the concessionaires. So what I was referring to was, I think with the benefit of hindsight, as we look here now, that structure looks, looks un unduly complex, yeah. and maybe somewhat yeah. unwieldy. Uh, it's difficult for uh, the partners to <laughs> be clear who's, where the responsibility is like, and I think it, it wants simplifying. And I think saying that um, is something that Amongst all the parties, we, we agree, and this is being discussed, how that will happen. Just, just one last question. 
should the NLDC be, be folded up? Should it be time limited? What, what would be the loss? What, what would we lose as Londoners if, if you were to be folded? Uh, what London would lose um, if LLDC was uh, more time limited than uh, currently planned is the, is the billions of pounds of economic value that's being created by uh, the investment we're delivering. Um, <coughs> the business case that uh, for the culture and education district alone uh, that's, that's being considered uh, and, and firming up our funding for that, it anticipates billions of pounds of economic value just from the fact we will, for example, be bringing world class, two world-class universities uh, it joining uh, a university, a world-class university, already on the park, so there'll be three world-class uh, cultural partners coming to the park. Uh, the 24,000 homes will be uh, developed in our area. Uh, the park, as a, as a visitor destination, that uh, six million people plus a year are enjoying, uh, I think London would lose an enormous amount. Uh, and the future, the long-term value of all that investment, I think would be an enormous loss. But it is a choice if some, that's what somebody wanted to decide. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have five members with follow-up questions. I'll start with Assemblymember Desai. Uh, David, I note your answers to Assemblymember um, Bailey's um, questions about the financial sustainability of the stadium. Uh, so uh, I won't repeat his questions, but just to be very specific and much more direct than, assembly, than may I suggest Assemblymember Bailey was, you talked about the stadium moving to about the uh, LLDC moving to a stable financial footing. You talked about long-term aspirations. You talked about uh, making good progress. But you are not in a position today to tell us that when, uh, when will the LLDC have enough financial stability to be wound down? Yes or no? Uh, I, I, the qu the question, there are two parts to the question because no. there is both a financial and there is a decision about winding down. Those are not, those are not necessarily the same I'm constrained thing. by time, David. Sorry to interrupt, but our time constraints are not all the answers to Assemblyman Bailey's questions. So my question is very direct. You're not in a position today to tell us about um, when you'll be in a position to actually be wound down. Uh, the decision about when LLDC is wound down is a decision that the Mayor will make in consultation with borough leaders and, uh, and Peter as the Chair of LLDC, looking at when is the right time okay to stop having an organisation, but it, the financial factors are a, very, a significant part of that, but not the only factors, because there is the benefit that's being delivered I, and deciding isn't the right time, sorry, you don't want a development corporation. And, and we need to do some work first. Sorry? And we need to do some work first on a plan to okay. wind it down. Just moving on very quickly to the issue of naming rights, again, I note your answers to Assembly Member uh, Bailey's questions. I asked you about this, David, back in January. And in opening statement today, you talked in glowing terms about the stadium, um, all the successes and so on. But in January, at budget and performance, from memory, you said you're confident, in fact, you're very confident about securing uh, a deal with, with, a, with, a, with a sponsor. We are now coming towards the end of 2017. Are you still that confident? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think uh, absolutely confident that in time, uh, selling naming rights for a stadium, this is a multi-million pound and multi-year commitment for a partner, and I think the I, process of finding a partner that is aligned in terms of its objectives and aspirations and wants to be associated with the stadium and the stadium suitable is a, is a situation that often takes time. I'm absolutely confident it will happen uh, in the future, confident. but again, it's, it's difficult to put a time scale when the right partner comes forward with the right commitment. I'm, but sure, I'm the, sure we'll come the, back to this topic again. I know that you're extremely confident now that the, coming to the end of October. But with so. the fact we have got a mayoral review going on on the stadium does mean we are not actively marketing it in the way sure. we would otherwise at the moment. Um, if I can just move on to some specific issues, um, uh, Peter and David. Um, when will that LLDC be in a position to return planning powers to the five boroughs? In May 2017, I believe the five boroughs, the leaders of the five boroughs wrote to you requesting a start of discussions, wrote to the mayor requesting a start of discussions around returning planning powers. So when do you think we'll be in a position to return planning powers and what would be the risk and benefits of returning these powers to the boroughs? So, um, I can't say yet because I haven't been there long. Uh, when the Mayor appointed me, he asked me to uh, work on plans to look at uh, the long-term future of the park and the LLDC. Part of that <coughs> is indeed to look at the uh, return of the planning powers. So we'll start that work uh, early next year and we'll see where it, where it takes us. In the meantime, actually developing out the park in the in the way that it's been planned already has proved to be a great success so far uh, and I can't see any reason why we shouldn't carry on doing that until we find some other methodology of, 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 of proceeding. 
I think, I think in, in doing that work, it would have to be considered that there is benefit at the moment from the planning powers being with the development powers. That was the logic that was applied when the development corporation was set up, to have those combined powers to enable regeneration to happen in an accelerated way and with one point of contact for developers, for applicants uh, and for, and for uh, boroughs and, and all the uh, partner organisations we work with. So the question I think will be partly about when's the right time where you can actually lose the benefit of be being together um, will, will be a consideration in that. Because at the moment, whilst we're still developing, for example, the, you know, the culture and education district, planning applications will be going on uh, over the next two to three years um, and, and uh, you know, as they go through uh, initial planning and then, and then detail. So the, the, there is a challenge around the right time to yeah. break up something that has worked in the way it has over the last few years. Um, okay, um, just a minute, Member. Uh, we have got a second question on the future of the LLDC, so can I take you back to finances for your, yeah, okay, fine. This uh, is the rest of your questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, talking specifically about finances, there seems to be a lot of focus on the fixed estate charge to repay your mm -hmm. debts. Uh, what are the risks around this? Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The fixed estate charge is a very important part of the long-term plan. Um, and the idea is that it is a, um, a charge that incoming uh, tenants and partners pay to be part of the park and the wider development and enjoying uh, the whole estate that, that has been created. Um, there's, uh, I think, little... It is now consumed into a mayoral direction, uh, so it has a, a sort of a legal basis. Uh, I think there's... Uh, we have started applying it to the tenants uh, who are on the park, so I think um, the principle and the practice are well established, so I don't see particular risk in, in those respects. The risk we're uh, facing over the next few years as we move towards a more financially sustainable position is about the pace of development and therefore the pace by which uh, developments get completed and charges start getting levied, and that's, that's the uncertainty I referred to earlier. But basically once developments are completed, the charge flows and we'll go into our income. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblymember Shaw. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, David, uh, this morning in your presentation, you mentioned referring to Olympic Park and particularly the venues mm. that uh, uh, there, there is, uh, that they're becoming a major destination. That's good news and uh, I welcome that. Uh, leaving aside the stadium, can you tell the Assembly what is the medium and long-term financial viability of the venues uh, within the park? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, the, I suppose there were four main venues we manage. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, Aquatic Centre um, and the Copper Box we manage under one contract. Um, and the challenge there has been, since they reopened in uh, 2014, uh, having been closed uh, for transformation after the Games, uh, has been to um, move them to a much more sustainable footing. Uh, I should say that the um, visitor numbers for both venues have been uh, have been fantastic, uh, and I think maybe greater than uh, anyone anticipated before. So uh, the Copper Box, in uh, about four years since it reopened, has had uh, about 1.7 million uh, visitors. Uh, the Aquatic Centre, um, in the same period, uh, over over three million, or in fact, in a short period, about three and a half years, over three million visitors. Um, and we do, in relation to the financial position, we do price these venues. Uh, we price usage for the swims at the aquatic centre, the usage, etc., of a copper box, to be comparable to other local venues uh, in, in the host borough areas, not to maximise the income. And that is really so that we are, again, respecting the uh, commitments of the legacy, that we would make these uh, facilities accessible to local people and that local people are, in fact, the predominant uh, users. So um, on the financial uh, position, as you described, um, the Aquatic Centre, we have uh, reduced the operating uh, subsidy, or the deficit it generates on its operations very significantly from the initial years. Uh, some of that is uh, through the measures I referred to earlier in relation to uh, really intensive work about making the utilities uh, operation more efficient. Uh, we've reduced the rates bill. We challenge all the time the operating costs uh, there and the, the operating uh, subsidy required has reduced significantly. Uh, on the copper box, it is now operating on its sort of uh, routine day to day operations. It makes a small surplus, so it is uh, moved into that position, which is very welcome. Um, uh, but again, there's, there's uh, challenges we're looking at around the uh, wider building management and estate management and how we reduce those. 
On the uh, orbit and on three mills, we've been able to turn what were venues requiring a uh, subsidy into ones that now make a surplus and contribute to our finances. So uh, on the orbit, the introduction of the slide about uh, 18 months ago uh, has turned that from a venue that did require uh, a deficit, about £600,000 in 2015-16, to one that made uh, a small surplus last year and a much larger surplus this year, around half a million. So we're getting to the point where uh, actually those surpluses are, uh, are, are reaching the point greater than the deficits were previously uh, as we've turned that around. So I'm very pleased about that. And on three mills, uh, which is a very significant uh, studio operation for London, uh, again, day, sort of the annual operation has been uh, in a surplus for the last uh, couple of years, uh, having previously again been uh, making a loss. And we've worked hard with the uh, venue operator there to make sure that that is uh, making a contribution to our finances. I should say long term, which was your question, uh, if three mills is to continue operating in its current mode, it will need significant further investment. Uh, and it hadn't originally been our plans that we should maintain long-term ownership and that therefore we should uh, make that investment, but that is a discussion we're having. But we're not the freeholder. We, we have a lease on, on three mills. Uh, there is a question about its future. So uh, if it is to carry on generating the uh, annual surpluses it has contributed for the last couple of years, it will need further investment. D David, in the long term, uh, can you tell us whether uh, both uh, Copper Box as well as Aquatic Centre will continue to remain uh, financially uh, sustainable as well as affordable to the local residents and communities? Um, so, I mean, that, that is the challenge, as you say, because keeping them affordable to uh, the local residents has been our priority and the pricing has reflected that. Um, they are, I think, in their own right, world-class venues. Um, very few uh, swimming facilities, I think, have anything like the scale and uh, span and and the footprint of, of the aquatic centre. So what, what I can say is that we are continuing to re bring down the cost to challenge the, the cost of running it. Um, but it would be an unusual, I think, an unusual swimming facility in London that didn't need some sort of subsidy. And this is on a, on a fantastic scale. It's a world-class facility. Um, but it is, I suppose, supporting the venues as part of the park, as part of the envi environment we've created, is part of what the fixed estate charge will long-term uh, help LLDC and its successive organisations to do because it will enable us to keep that whole uh, state uh, together and provide that financial resource. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblymember Duval. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Chair, I think uh, David was very correct in not giving us a date of when um, uh, LDDC would be uh, balancing the books, but I can go back to a previous chair back in 2000 and. 14, in answer to uh, Assemblymember Boff's question, the then chair said, the, oh, I should say, the then chair was Boris Johnson, who said that, um, that they, the aim to be self-financing was 2017 stroke 18, and this was a considerable achievement. But the reason why I want to quote him a little bit further, because I want to drill down on the stadium. I know that we are going to come to this later, I do not want to anticipate the question, but the deal that we've done in the stadium will actually mean, unlike virtually any other Olympic stadium I can think of around the world, there will be no extra revenue funding going into the stadium. So I want to talk about the challenge, I think the key challenge that you're facing at the moment that must be where you're losing sleep is around the stadium and its finances and some of the issues that have arisen. And I was very interested to see in some uh, research around some of the legal costs that have been incurred since 2013, which I think is acceptable, but by any stretch of the imagination, are rather on the high side of around three and a half million. And I was particularly keen to see the cost incurred by E20 and between E20 and West Ham. I wasn't clear who was challenging who in those legal arrangements, and maybe you could shed some light on that. Um, but it does say, uh, around some of the contract issues, uh, which I want to go on further in some terms of the other contracts, there is a particular problem. Do you want to comment on those legal costs as where you see those, and particularly E20? Now, I should talk about E20, because let, let's cut through the crap, really, 
E20 is really an only owned subsidiary. It might be a joint venture between you, uh, Newham and yourself, but we are funding it. You, LDBC, GLA, with the Mayor's uh, bank role at the back of you. So can we just, can you throw some, shed some light on that? Who's doing what to <coughs> whom? Yes, of course. And where and why? Um, so I think, first of all, just on E20, just factually, it's not an LLDC subsidiary. It is a joint venture. It is established as a joint venture, jointly owned by LLDC and Newham. So um, I think, if you don't mind, just to correct that, 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 that would be a wrong uh, uh, understanding to leave on the record. Uh, but to go to your point, the um, legal fees you refer to um, have been, uh, and I've I think the figures you refer to actually are both from E20 and LLDC, so to, that's not, we don't need to labour on the uh, distinction. Um, they were from uh, the period from uh, 2013, so they did include uh, the early years negotiations of the original agreement, so the agreement, the West Ham concession, the UK Athletics concession and the operator agreement, as well as uh, issues that we've had since uh, the stadium opened, so they included all those the negotiation of them, and as, as is well known, there was significant legal challenges to those. So the costs that have been incurred by LLDC and E20, uh, that, that uh, three and a half million figure that, that we'd released, was, uh, was a combination of those early years, costs of originally negotiating the agreements and, uh, and the disputes around those, and some more recent uh, challenges, which I think is where you're uh, focusing. I think in relation to uh, more recent costs uh, that we've spent on, on legal advisors, um, I think the first thing I'd say, I think, you know, from my point of view, um, accountable for our uh, spend on, on these sorts of matters and accountable for the public money we, we do spend, we always make sure we've got, we don't go into any uh, legal expenditure without having strong legal advice uh, on, our, on our case uh, and that actually we are, taking, uh, we, we are taking legal steps where we are defending uh, the public person defending up the public money, um, so so all our uh, all our expenditure is is predicated on that. Um, we have had uh, some legal challenges since uh, since the stadium became fully operational with West Ham moving in uh, last year, uh, and we've had issues where uh, we've had strong legal advice that we should uh, defend uh, E20's rights and entitlements under that uh, concession agreement. Um, I would say again in the spirit that we um, we are very careful about making those sorts of commitments and very mindful of, uh, not of, of the public money we're spending is that we don't quickly go to uh, legal action uh, or to, to legal proceedings. Uh, we seek negotiated agreements wherever we can and there are a number of issues uh, where we have reached um, a negotiated settlement where we could satisfy ourselves we were getting good value and an appropriate uh, uh, value for the public purse from agreements with West Ham. And, uh, there's, there's some of the signage inside the stadium, the pitch side sign, signage, the fan installation, which I think you'll be familiar with, uh, where we've negotiated those sorts of, of agreements, um, where we've, we've defended our rights, if you like, but being able to reach a negotiated settlement uh, with, with West Ham. But where we do have strong legal advice on our rights under the, under the concession agreement, that we need to defend those rights, and in doing so our, our, our public value, then we have uh, used uh, legal advice uh, on those. I think you asked about the genesis of those uh, proceedings. I can say to you that all the proceedings, all the legal proceedings we're involved in, uh, have been instigated by West Ham. Uh, all of them are, we are, if you like, the defendant uh, protecting our interests. We haven't instigated any of them. So uh, that, that's the position. But we are defending them where we had strong legal advice, that we are protecting the rights uh, and entitlements that we have under the concession agreement. Okay. Can we move on to some of the other contracts? I mean, it might include West Ham. I think in one of the LDDC documents, it might be in your annual report, you talk about onerous contracts. Yeah. So are, are the onerous contracts that we're referring to are the agreements with tenants such as West Ham and the Athletics, um, but also you've got other contracts on catering as well as the E20 management. Uh, their, their contract, you don't call on, there's a probably yeah, technical yeah. term, as a lay person is, what, what? I, I think I think uh, the I might need to check. I th so the, we, we have three main agreements in, in E20. There's the two concessions, uh, the one with West Ham and the one with UK Athletics, uh, and there is an agreement with uh, the operator uh, that is to manage and operate the stadium and to bring in uh, events and generate uh, activity and, and usage of the stadium. So so that's quite different to the two concessions. Um, I'm, I'm 
I'm, I might need to check and confirm to you, but I'm, I'm almost completely confident that the owner's contracts provision relates to, if you, have, if you like, the costs that arise from the two concession agreements. Uh, part of having both means uh, that he would quite involve the seat moves to, to change the configuration of the stadium. Um, so I think I, I referred earlier in, to, to, to the question to Assembly uh, Member uh, Prince about the, um, when we talk about the challenges, that there's, um, you know, the seats are a significant uh, challenge themselves. Uh, match day costs and, and operating uh, is a significant uh, cost. And effectively, the owner's contracts provision recognises the long-term value uh, of operating both concessions um, on the, uh, I suppose it's worth saying, on the UK Athletics Agreement that E20 doesn't, uh, other than very small parts of the catering, basically doesn't get any income. It's a, it's a uh, facility where the uh, UK Athletics come in and use, have the rights to the stadium for a month uh, and the income accrues to UK Athletics. Um, and we have uh, challenges, as, as I think you'll know and we've talked about before, around operating uh, the stadium for West Ham match days, which means that make, that those contracts in aggregate uh, are onerous. Uh, we make a loss across the piece. And the provision that was made was the long-term value of those. I was quite surprised about the two contracts relating to the management of the stadium and the catering arrangements. And I tried to look very carefully at those two organisations of what profit they were making out of their operations in the stadium. I kid you not, I'd like you to comment on it, why, why would we have a form of contracts where almost we are, it's legal, but we are endorsing legal tax avoidance because the profits they make here in terms of the stadium, they're registering as nil. That can't be right, is it? Are we making any money out of, um, not so much on the management sure of the stadium, but out of the catering issues? Is, is, is E20 making any money at all about any other events? You've explained about athletics, Tell us about the other arrangements that they have for other events in that stadium. So we have a contract with, um, with an operator. Uh, so it's only, from E20's point of view, it's one contract with an operator. It has subcontractors who provide, for example, the facilities management and, and the catering and um, you know, manage the pitch and all those sorts of, uh, and the building maintenance, all the various services that are required to operate the stadium and to bring in uh, future events. Um, the, we, we do, we share in, we, we do uh, share in the income that comes from uh, catering uh, under that agreement. So uh, uh, we have, I mean, th those are actually reflected in the specific concession agreement uh, entitlements, but flow then through into the operator agreement. Uh, so we do, we do, to answer your question, we do get income from catering. We do share in that income, but it's a sharing under the various agreements. Um, the operator agreement is basically set up that we pay a fixed fee uh, related to uh, costs that are necessary for them to run the stadium and then there is a, um, a revenue sharing arrangement where the net costs of uh, operating the stadium it is intended to generate net revenues and we uh, take a share and the operator keeps a share so that they are incentivised to generate them but we take most of the share of, uh, of surplus where there are not net operating revenues. So for this assembly just to be clear we've got a problem with some of our major concessionaires and use of the stadium we've got some problems around other contracts and that at some stage when more stevens arrives with the report and with some additional reports that you're doing which you mentioned earlier to an earlier assembly <coughs> budgetary <coughs> meeting yeah. we are going to have a coherent set of decisions are they your decisions, LDDC's decisions, or are they decisions that come out of this building? Um, the, so I mentioned earlier that part of the decisions will be about the future ownership, which will uh, help answer that question. Yeah. Uh, certainly the scale of the challenge and the uh, issues we're dealing with, which you've described, are ones that where we, we are liaising very closely with uh, City Hall colleagues. Uh, the More Stevens Review is an important part of establishing, if you like, how we got here, uh, what, the, what the position is and, and why that was arrived at. And I think that will be an important part of informing the discussions about the future. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, this was discussed in the, in the recent budget committee, but there is frustration which uh, City Hall colleagues have expressed as well as, uh, as, well, as, well as us that that's, that's, you know, waited for uh, impatiently. Um, so, so there is a, a real desire to get that piece of the analysis to get on with the various work streams we are in terms of how we can improve uh, the performance of the stadium and, as you say, effectively come to a coherent view about what's the best way of 
managing it forward. Um, I think it is inconceivable that any of those decisions would, would be made without uh, City Hall being fully involved because the financial exposure is so such that it's clearly a decision we would take working with uh, the Mayor and his team. And those decisions need to have been, we really need to have taken them actually a couple of months ago. We're still waiting. So I want to put, do you think we're going to be taking those, crisp, uh, those decisions? You'll be setting those out, talking to City Hall uh, before Christmas? Uh, we've been, so I think uh, uh, David Bellamy wrote to uh, the Chair of the Budget Committee after the last hearing saying that he, I think, uh, were, I think expecting to see, uh, or hoping or expecting to see, uh, product from the Moore Stevens review by the end of November. Um, I should say, so I think the conversation on that will happen before Christmas, but actually the conversations about what we're doing to improve the position, uh, the work on the seat system, the work on match day costs, the work on uh, rights, all those sorts of things is going on now anyway, it's not waiting, uh, but we're fully uh, involved in City Hall colleagues. But the information that the Moore Stevens review will give us and the context and the background that will help provide, uh, I expect to be discussing uh, around the end of the month when that report comes in. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got four more speakers, still on finances. Uh, Assemblymember Bacon. Yeah, um, I'll start by saying, to, to echo something you said earlier on, uh, David, and was echoed by Sir Peter, uh, Sir Peter um, as a regeneration project, uh, I think it has to be acknowledged that it's successful. Um, Compared to any other uh, Olympic city uh, in the past, I think what's happened in London is transformationally better than anywhere else. That said, of course, there are some caveats to that. Uh, and the biggest running saw is the stadium. And I'm going to go back over a couple of the points that have been covered by the members just to try to get more, more detail. Firstly, the, when you were talking about the naming rights earlier on and the fact that you're not currently marketing on the naming rights, uh, you attributed it to two things. I think. Primarily it was around who really owns the stadium, so the, the, the ownership issue because of the joint venture, which I'll come on to in a moment. And secondly, you said that um, because of the mayoral review, you're not marketing the stadium uh, as you would have liked to, or words to that effect. I, I don't want to misquote you. On the joint venture, what is the balance of ownership between uh, the LLDC and Newham as part of the E20 umbrella? So E20 is 65% uh, LLDC, 35% Newham. Okay. So we are the majority owner. So if you were to proceed with a naming rights deal, would that mean that 65% of the revenue from that would come to the LLDC and 35 would go to Newham? Is that correct? Uh, in, in principle, so, so the, the uh, E20 is, is an entity, that, so it, it, it would receive the income. If E20 generates surpluses, then those would be distributed back to its members in, in membership shares, yes. Okay, there is, I should say, I mean, just, I'm, I'm yeah, loath to add complexity on complexity. There isn't Newham's uh, in initial investment went in with, with a, uh, an, um, an agreement about how that would be paid back out of surpluses, which meant they, they take some of that return first. Right. Does, where, would West Ham United get income from that as well? Um, so the uh, West Ham concession agreement provides that over a threshold of naming rights income, then West Ham would share. But the first... Okay, uh, provided it goes beyond a certain figure, only West Ham would get a cut off the surplus rather than the overall... Correct. Okay, I understand that. Um, where are we at then? Because uh, you've, I think, put great value on the fact that the um, ownership is being sorted out. Uh, there's a bit of a, a tangled web here and it needs to be sort of simplified before you can proceed with properly going for a naming rights deal. Is, have I understood that correctly? Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't meaning to imply that. I, th I think in relation to naming rights, I was uh, referring I, mainly, I think, to the fact there is the Mayor's Review looking at um, the, uh, the stadium in in so how we got here teams. and the future, of which one strand is the ownership. And whilst that package of work is going on, uh, it didn't seem appropriate to be promoting the stadium to potential naming rights partners. Okay. So it's not only about the, name, the ownership, it's about the Mayor's review generally and looking at the future direction and how that's resolved before we have a proposition. I think, to, to, to apply the converse, I wouldn't want to be going out to the market saying, you know, come and market and name this uh, stadium for multi-million pounds a year to major corporates yeah. if there is un unresolved questions about its future I, I, I uh, completely operation. understand because we, we seem to have got into a very tangled web about who owns the stadium and, and who would get any income and, and everything else and I do entirely understand why you'd want to simplify it. Um, the difficulty though is that um, figures have been banded around um, the, apparently in the E20 profit and loss account uh, which I haven't had sight of so this is hearsay 
Um, there's a figure included in that in the medium term profit and loss of four and a half million pounds per year income, projected income, uh, from a naming rights deal on the stadium, which would of course go some way uh, to making uh, the contractual arrangements yeah. less onerous, to use the, the accounting term. Um, that being so, the longer this goes on, the, the less income you are drawing down now, where there is a problem now. So when are you expecting the naming rights situation to be resolved, the ownership situation to be resolved, so you can then pursue a naming rights deal? Um, I, I think in the near future, I don't think that will be long. Um, I'm hoping that it will be, it will be you know, in the short term, as in weeks, months, not years at all. So uh, you in know, 2017? I think uh, I'd hope it to be resolved in this financial year. In this financial year, so yeah. we're looking at March the 31st, but quite, I mean, 2018. So I'm trying not, I don't want to, I think it will get announced when it's ready to be announced. It will be, it will be soon, um, and soon. there's a lot of work going on to resolve that immediately. Okay, so once that's done, uh, and I don't doubt you that there is work going on, I know there is, um, will you be proceeding with marketing the stadium as soon as possible after that? Uh, I think once that's done, and there is clarity on the future direction, of which getting the outcome from the more Stevens work and decisions that we'd make uh, the future ownership uh, where that's sitting would make uh, about future direction, then I think you'd be in a position to go back to the market. But I think you would want greater clarity about the, the, all the issues I've referred to before that was taken forward. Yes, I know. And I, I appreciate the question I'm about to ask you now. I feel on about to ask it, but it is a how long is a piece of string question. How long is that going to take? <laughs> I think you answered it yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's the danger with pressing the marks, isn't it? Um, the other thing that I want to pick up as well is the uh, issue of the seats and moving the seats. And uh, a comment you made earlier on uh, is that you found ways of dramatically reducing the cost of moving the seating um, from what to what. But the figure that we understand is the cost at the moment, or was the cost last summer, is eight million pounds, which is what's being looked at every year. Uh, is that a figure that you recognize? And if the reconfiguration that you've been looking at is dramatically reducing it, what's it now settling at? Uh, it's a figure I recognise, yes. Um, I think the, we had particular challenges this summer because we were hosting uh, well not, opportunities and challenges. We were hosting the great, probably the biggest sports event in the world, in the world uh, this year uh, with the World Athletics. But as a, a sort of uh, estimate of what that would be to move all four stands in future years, uh, that, that's a number we recognise. Um, the, the largest single part of that, I think naturally four stands in a stadium, uh, the East Stand is much the largest and much the most uh, complex to move um, and uh, to illustrate the sort of opportunity we've identified when we hosted the 2016 Diamond League events, uh, we took some of the rows off the front of the East Stand and some moved some blocks but we didn't move the stand and that dramatically reduces uh, the cost um, and so uh, the opportunity to do that sort of arrangement in future mm -hmm. would bring down the cost very significantly. Uh, we're then looking in the same way at the other stands and saying, actually, how much do we really need to move to make it work as an athletics venue uh, and also to host concerts, which bring in significant income, um, and how much can we, uh, can we uh, you know, minimise those moves and minimise, therefore, the cost and the time. So I think that initial work, um, I would hope, uh, it, it is work in progress. It's still being worked through. We have got a configuration for next year. We've agreed with UK Athletics that... Um, I think I would say it's a, it, it more than reduces, the more than halves the cost. Of, more than halves the cost. So uh, but we've still got the work going on, uh, and I wouldn't want you to think that was the end of the story. We've got the work going on with the engineers looking at a more uh, fundamental review and seeing if there's something that can reduce those costs much further. Okay, so, so we can... It's very material. Without wanting to pin you down too ruthlessly, uh, we can expect it to go down by around about £4 million, pounds, uh, but could be even more than that. That's the sort of work we're territory we're trying to get to, yes. Okay, thank you. Assemblymember Both. Um, how can something be described as sustainable when London taxpayers will have to keep um, propping you up every year and you can't tell us when that's going to stop? How is that sustainable? Uh, well, I think I haven't said it is sustainable. I've said we're trying to reach a point where it's... Oh, it's, it's not sustainable. Uh, right. No, no, I said, and we're on a trend towards reaching that. So um, the uh, aspiration, having a business model that is about upfront investment to deliver uh, long-term regeneration gains and long-term financial returns, is that we will uh, move it towards it being financially sustainable in its own right. Um, but it is a long term, it is absolutely a long term operation. It's not something we've ever said we were going to be in any time uh, around now. 
and would, uh, would, we, are, we, are, we are making good progress on that, as I referred earlier. We've taken okay. about £9 million a year out of the uh, subsidy we're requiring from the GLA over the five years of, of current plans. So um, I think we have made good progress towards reaching that uh, long-term position. Um, but that is a work in progress that will be, will be long term as we, at the moment, we're still investing in, in development. We're a development corporation uh, and that's what we're there for. Um, but we're not yet uh, generating the returns that make it sustainable on its own right without so, investment. So like my, my weekly lottery ticket, I'm aiming for that expenditure to be sustainable. Uh, but I can't guarantee it in the long term. Is, is, is that what we're saying? No. Good. We're saying, we're saying, we're saying there's investment in tangible to, regeneration. You referred to uh, a £200 million pound provision within um, uh, for, well, a £200 million pound provision, which doesn't seem to be filled by anything. I mean, the last time I heard people explain that this sum of money isn't really under threat and we're going to get it all back, it was from the Mayor of Newham saying that £40 million pound investment in the E20 company was perfectly all right and we're going to get it back. We now know that £40 million isn't going to be coming back, or is most unlikely, uh, unless they spend it all on lottery tickets, um, is most unlikely to come back uh, to the, the uh, residents of Newham. What guarantees have you got that that £200 million pound is actually going to be covered? Because in your, aunt, your previous answers, I heard no guarantees. I heard hopes, aspirations and aiming for, but no guarantees. Uh, I don't think there are any guarantees and I'm not offering any or pretending I am. Uh, what I'm saying is that, first of all, the stadium makes a massive contribution to the regeneration that delivers billions of pounds, not millions, billions of pounds of economic value to the local area. Peter referred to the uh, recent uh, Oxford Economics report, an independent review, which said there's going to be a quarter of a million more jobs than we previously anticipated in the area, and that's part of billions of pounds of economic value. The £200 million is a provision for future losses over the long term of contracts that we have uh, described in our accounts as onerous, but the work I referred to is about reducing those costs considerably, the costs as we've just talked about around seat moves, the cost of operating the stadium, the uh, simplifying the ownership, uh, the costs around uh, or the potential value from rights, all of which will significantly reduce that, uh, but that is all work that's going on at the moment. Uh, the agreements are very long term and it's important that we work through it thoroughly to get it right, but that is work that is still going on. Uh, you referred to earlier that you wanted to avoid or to get involved in any future legal challenges. Now that we know that that £40 million from Newham is effectively a, um, uh, uh, a gift from Newham uh, to E20, isn't it about time that you referred the Olympic project to the Commission to see whether or not it now falls foul, foul of the state aid regulations? Uh, I, don't I mean, you, you do it rather than wait for somebody else to do it for you. Um, well, so I think in relation to Newham's investment, I would have to say that was for Newham to account for. So I can't, uh, I can't uh, explain or account for their uh, investment decisions. Uh, I can say, as I've said before, that first of all, I think the uh, stadium delivers enormous economic value. That we are reducing uh, the cost and taking all the measures I referred to earlier to make sure that the uh, financial burden is minimised. Uh, but that's a long-term aspiration. It's a long-term piece of work to contribute to the long-term benefits that the stadium contributes to in terms of regenerating the local area. Have you made an estimate of how much it will cost to pull out of the onerous agreement with West Ham? Uh, well, I, that's, that's, not on our, uh, that's not one of the things we're looking at because we have got a 99-year agreement um, and I think it would be, uh, I think the, uh, the, potential, uh, it, it, the potential benefit of bringing uh, or having uh, Premier League football in the area is a big part of the benefits. We, we, know I, that. I, I, we know all that, I've read the document, but don't you think it would be wise for you to prepare for uh, uh, the pulling out of the agreement with West Ham, to at least know what the costs are going to be? Well, I think it is important that we recognise that the value that the stadium, with West Ham as a Premier League club, as the tenant, brings enormous value to the area. So, the well, I, what I'm, I'm enough, asking your question, really, my, is it? It, such an analysis would require an analysis of both the yeah. direct financial cost to buy out uh, a Premier League club of the home they're committed to for 99 years, and of the economic value that the stadium contributes to the wider regeneration, which would be in billions. And I think that... Um, 
I, I don't need to do too much more detailed work to know that that's, that's probably not, not an amount that the Assembly would be keen we were uh, losing.